we are recording. Just give it one more minute. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start. Let me make sure Christy is on mute. And we are go. We've got 22 attendees right now. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Michael Hart. I'll be one of your presenters this morning. I'll introduce Ty Hodak in just a second. I wanted to mention that we are indeed recording this, and we will be sending you an email with a link in it, which will allow you to access the recording anytime you would like this to be for you. And I don't, I think at the very latest, that'll happen in just the next couple of days. I also wanted to point out, uh, we sent you a copy of the slides this morning for note taking, and at the end of those slides, there are a couple of pages of resources so that. As we roll through these slides today, it may very well prompt your interest in doing a deeper dive and getting more information about some of these tools and some of the things we talk about. So we wanted to try to facilitate that for you by creating a, a series of resources that we can start with. So uh, allow me to welcome my colleague, Ty Hodak, uh, as you probably read. Ty is the Executive Director of Instructional Programs for Special Populations at the Tennessee Department of Education. And in that role, she literally co-led the development of the RTI framework in Tennessee. And largely, she's been responsible for an instructional programming team that provides large-scale trainings as well as technical assistance for general educators, special educators, as well as administrators all across the state of Tennessee. So welcome, Ty, and would you like to uh, add a few comments about your background? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, well, I, I would like to start out saying that first I was, um, I came from Michigan around nine years ago. Um, I served in several capacities in the school, including reading interventionist and school psychologist. I like to refer now as a recovering school psychologist, um, but spend much, much of my career thus far in the RTI world, screening for reading, um, aligning interventions for students, and and uh, monitoring their progress to determine what level of support they need. So, um, have been doing this for a while. I'm excited to be here today. Thank you. Thanks very much for that. Okay, so let's just spend a minute talking about today's roadmap. Really, we're thinking about this as almost like a two-part uh, experience today. In the front half, we're going to talk a lot about information and some of the decision-making processes that we need to think about in terms of a universal screening process. And then we're going to have a very significant chunk of time spent talking about really the nuts and bolts of implementation. And I'm going to briefly touch on the importance of universal screening we're going to talk about some very popular or very well-known measures that are being used because we know some of you have already engaged in this process quite a bit in terms of just monitoring progress and so forth. You know, we're going to talk about what they are, what they measure, and I think what's, what's really especially cool about today is that Ty is going to share with us the matrix that she and her team at the University of Tennessee, or excuse me, the state of Tennessee created for their own process of comparing and contrasting the various tools that are made available. And I think the, the greatest value of that is it truly is reality-based. And so this is not an academic exercise. This is not just a, a download of information. This is really about really true what's going on with best practices and overcoming challenges and what she experienced in these really 
large scale trainings that she's been doing all over the state. Now, the second half is actually going to be broken up into, I'm going to do a moderated version of Q&A with Ty, where I, we've got some pre-selected questions that I'm going to ask Ty to elaborate on. I think you'll find that to be super helpful on a, on a kind of best practices basis. And also then at the end, we're going to open it up uh, for a live Q&A. And our fabulous producer, Christy, is standing by. She's going to be monitoring the chat room or the chat box. And if you have a question that you would like us to answer live today, please be sure to uh, put that into the chat box. She'll monitor it at the end. We'll be able to see if we, if we can answer as many questions as possible. Now, I, I, I always like, whenever I present, I always like to just take a moment to talk about uh, some things that are really important values, I think, for both Ty and I. I think we've really ready, we're really ready to turn the wait and see approach on its head. I bet every single person on this call is well aware of the absolute importance of early intervention for us to be most efficient and effective in treating the kids who identify with issues with reading or other academic issues. So really the purpose of the universal screening process is to identify students that are at risk for future failure, catch them early, and in that sense be much, uh, much more effective in terms of being able to remediate the issue. So this is like the first universal checkpoint, so to speak, for early intervention. Now, the other thing that I, the other point that I want to make point here is that this is not going to work unless we support the teachers and we engage and involve the teachers from the very beginning so that there's a sense of ownership and collaboration so that ultimately this feels like something that is going to make the teachers' lives better as opposed to another onerous, top-down, heavy mandate from uh, the state or the feds. So that is kind of the backdrop or the, the, the context that we think about when we think about uh, when Ty later on talks about uh, the team and how it should be organized and who should be on it and all that stuff. So. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, Ty, would you, do you want to add anything to that? Was that fine? No, I, I, I would definitely agree. Um, you know, my purpose is trying to really um, put all the pieces together in schools. And one thing that we do know is anyone, not from the state level, not from the district level, um, not even a school administrator can replace the knowledge that teachers have because um, they're in those classrooms every single day with students. So they absolutely need to be a part of this whole framework and process and and own it. And sometimes it takes a lot of work to get them to the stage of owning it, a lot of professional development, but when they do, it's very powerful. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Okay, so let's do a quick review of a map or a template for assessing effectiveness from a statistical perspective. To be very clear, I'm not trying to take you back to your statistics course, and we're not going to talk about this in great detail, but these are some of the anchors you see on this slide that we use as we build a matrix for decision making. So why would I bring this up now? Why would I do this when it looks so kind of obvious? Because I want to ask you today during this two-hour period to kind of step back and reset and reconsider your thinking, because I know some people are... Some people who are listening are just now getting into the process of perhaps planning and trying to understand what it is that they need to do. Some people have been down the road quite a bit. And so there's a, there's a bit of a mix here. But regardless of where you are in that transition, we thought it would be a kind of a great opportunity for you to kind of step back and just remove any emotion or habits you have about this, the selection equation and just think about it as like, okay, let me just reassess. Let me make sure that we're heading in the right direction. And I think the, the pragmatic challenges of implementation, the process is going to be refined. It's going to be iterative. And I think Ty's going to talk about that a lot. But the idea is that while there may be bumps in the road, there may be hiccups, the important thing is that we've got to start 
with a screening process that actually measures what we really want it to. And, you know, it's sometimes as you get into this and you take a look at these tools, it can be really, you know, you can make you dizzy, quite frankly, because there's so much to consider and think through and, and make decisions about. But I think that's one of the things that Ty, Ty and I talked about when we put this together, and that was that today is a platform. Today is a nuts and bolts discussion about implementation that very likely will lead to uh, other discussions or trainings or webinars that we might do for you in the future predicated on what you feel your needs are. But I think we're going to leave you with quite a bit today that's going to uh, promote a lot of questions, maybe answer a lot of questions, uh, answer a lot of questions as well. And, um, uh, you know, hopefully our goal is to serve you in a way that's meaningful and helpful. So very quickly, we're going to step back, no matter where you are in the process, just use these as anchors. You know, this is not the only thing. There's a lot of pragmatic issues, but it's very, it's kind of on a very basic logical level. If we're going to use this tool to predict how every child will perform at some point in the future, how good would those predictions be? We really got to pay attention to predictive ability. And Ty's going to talk about that a lot in a little while. But we got to keep that in mind because there's so many other options and variables swirling around. This is kind of like an anchoring uh, concept that we have to keep in mind. Secondly, and tied with that is the classification. How well of a job do we do in being able to identify those kids that are at risk versus the kids that are not at risk? And how well will we do based on the outcome of their future performance? By the way, I love this uh, visual image that we have. But this is about making sure that we reduce the likelihood of for false positives and false negatives. And the better the job we do with this, the better we're going to be able to take care of our kids. And finally, obviously, of course, normative scoring. There are tools out there that will just give you a cut score. And if you don't have normative scoring, then your whole sense for being able to consider where the child is on a risk level you know, is it just barely below the cut score? Is it two standard deviations below the cut score? That's really critical information with regard to thinking about the intensity and type of remediation. So without normative scoring, you know, we, we only have the cut score. We only know where they're at. We don't know what their true risk is. So I think everybody knows that, but I think it's great to kind of step back and remember that and think about that as we move into the more pragmatic issues. So here are a list of very well-known tools. Some of you may know them better than others. This is, of course, not an exhaustive list, but most of you will be aware of and inverse in some of these tools, Ames Web and Dibbles, surely. However, you may not be aware of the predictive assessment of reading tool. That's, you know, this is my personal bias, and that is that it's an important tool to review and consider. In fact, one of the links in the resources pages, I think the very first one at the end of the slides, takes you to a white paper from Literate Nation about selecting screening instruments that, that I highly recommend. In fact, you know, reading that I highly recommend. One of the authors is with us today, Susan Smart, I think she's on the line. Uh, she's one of Literate Nation's board members and she and Steve Dykstra and Marianne uh, Wolf actually uh, were the authors on that. Uh, that article, that white paper, and they did a really fabulous job. So uh, welcome, Susan. Also, I've included in this list one of the best known tests for rapid automatic naming. Now, the RENRES is a bit different. And it's a bit different type of screening tool, and that's because those of you out there that are school psychologists, you recognize this probably from actual psychoeducational evaluations or more formal evaluations of a child with regard to their learning profile. However, I included it in this list for a couple of reasons. First, the research couldn't be more clear that weaknesses in rapid automatic gaming is a very strong predictor, particularly for future reading difficulties in the area of fluency and comprehension. And it's actually the research is showing it's pretty clear that it, this is an additional issue beyond phonological processing issues and that it's something that we really need to get our arms on 
our hands around and arms around early in the process. So um, I think it somehow should be included in the screening process. And I, I've had a conversation with Ty about this, and I want her to weigh in on this. But I want to ask her her thoughts on the most efficient way to get this information and how do you capture it because it's so incredibly important from what we know from the research now that we've got to make sure that we don't miss it. So, Ty, could you weigh in here and, and give us your thoughts on this issue? Okay, and you're referring to um, how yeah. the procedure happens at, in the schools or are you referring to how to get this information in general? Well, I think if we're talking about the context of uh, universal screening tools, mm -hmm. uh, how do we efficiently and quickly capture this information so it becomes a part of the variables that we think about when we think about what's important to understand about a child and their, their reading abilities? Okay, so a lot of these tools are made up of all the indicators of reading, and um, I think we're going to go into a lot around the research and uh, um, the, the things that it measures and how it measures these and the fact that they are indicators in not all areas of outcome. The way to really um, have this happen in the schools is, of course, understanding the evidence for these tools and making sure that we're making good decisions and then putting it in the framework of the school so that we are using the tool to really identify the areas um, that we want to measure and the areas that we want to teach in the school. And I think we'll go through a lot of those pieces um, as we're moving through um, as we're moving through today, but um, really there's a lot of websites, there's a lot of information, and um, as I'm going to go ahead and talk through in a couple of minutes, um, in Tennessee we have a lot, of, a lot at stake in identifying appropriate tools, so we didn't necessarily depend on websites, we actually created tools, um, evidence-based tools, so that we could take the research to bring it to practice. So I don't know if that helps a little bit, but um, realistically you have to find a um, systematic way to get this in schools and not just leave it up to the individual um, characteristics of the people in the schools to get this work done. Okay. Well, let's um, let's park the uh, rapid automatic naming thing until we get into the greater, the grittier part and then we'll have a conversation sure. about that because both of you and I know that it's, um, it's a great uh, predictive tool at a very early age that um, can help us uh, quickly identify these kids are going to need the extra help. So we'll, we'll, we'll park that and, and come back to it in a little while. So the next few slides are going to be some bullet points with regard to each of those five tools. Now, I, you don't need me to read this to you, but I wanted to serve as a bit of a reference point for you as you use these slides in your own practice and your own planning. I just want to give you something that you can take a quick look at and then if it feels like something you want to drill down into, that's where you go to the resources page and you find a lot more in-depth information about these tools. A lot of them look very similar in terms of, you know, touting themselves as a universal screening tool. Uh, several of them now are integrated with response to intervention and tiered instruction. Uh, Ames Web, frankly, happens to be uh, focused on reading and math, grades K through 12. And one of the points that I wanted to make was that some of these tools actually tie the results of the measures to instructional materials or intervention strategies. And that's not necessarily something that Ames Web does or does well. So whether that's a critical variable for you, you may have other ways to do that, but I thought I would kind of point that out so that that was a, kind of a critical variable for you as you take a look at Ames Web. And I thought it might be helpful just to have a, a quick view of the cost and the training recommended and how you can get that done. So that's Ames Web. Uh, another one we have is Easy CBM. Very similar. I think it might be considered to be a much more intuitive system that's you know, pretty easy for people to get up to speed on. Uh, it's also integrated with uh, RTI. This one claims to facilitate instruction and intervention. And, uh, you know, it's obviously benchmarking and progress monitoring and so on and so forth, developed by University of Oregon. These guys are grades K through 8, and their focus is on reading and mathematics. 
And one thing that I do like about ECCBM in, in my research anyway, and Ty can speak to this more directly, is that when you've got item level reporting, that allows you to do what I think is the most critical point. If you've got test scores, what value are they if you can't draw a line or make that leap to pinpointing what you actually do in the classroom? Instructional areas of concern and exactly what you do. So to me, in my own value system, and I think obviously time to, that's something that you have to keep in mind at all times. Is that, well, great, we're going to have all this data. But what does it mean? What do we do with it? What do we? How do we actually make that real and live in the classroom? So, I think we're getting better and better as the years go by in terms of appreciating that and actually building models and and methods for us to be able to do that. Now, I, I can't imagine there's anybody on the call that's not familiar with Dibbles. Obviously, Dibbles Next is the next iteration after the sixth edition. They are actually going to be providing uh, some early release materials with regard to math as well. I think it might be ostensibly it was out um, sometime in August of 2015. But you know, right now they're essentially well known for those uh, measures that function as indicators of the essential skills for proficient reading, and it checks a lot of boxes in terms of being really brief and. Uh, providing information that people can use for monitoring the development of their uh, early literacy and reading skills. Now they're also uh, they're going to release. I think they release it on a research level at least now at this stage. Uh, Dibble's deep diagnostic to identify and do a little bit better job in terms of identifying specific instructional targets. But I think that's an additional piece to it that may cost you more. Their pricing structure is a little bit different. Um, they talk about cost per classroom per year, and you'll see that the training is essentially the same as, say, something like Ames Web. So Dibbles is a very, very well-known test, and you really get – I think maybe this is the point at which I should say this. As a clinical psychologist, and I've conducted almost a 1,000 evaluations, um, what I find is that there's so much variability in how our kids' brains are wired that we got to be careful to, to understand that no one tool, no one test fits all. So, and that's another reason why I use the term a lot. It takes, I use that old cliche, it takes a village, because this is really about being creative as professionals. We use these tools that we believe are predictive and classify well, and we can, you know, garner good information about, but if we run against up against a kid or a group of kids that are really kind of challenging to the system we have in place, how do we organize as a team? And how do we start thinking about, okay, rather than thinking about the kid organizing around us, well, how can we think about how the team can organize around the child in a way that supports the developmental variations in terms of how their brain is wired? I think it's a very powerful notion to think about, even no matter what we, what we choose as a universal screener, how do we as leaders come together and support our team so that we kind of, in our teaching model, we simulate what should be going on in terms of the child's learning in their brain. I hope that makes sense. Um, but that's, that's what really kind of comes to mind when I think about the Dibbles and I think about the, the kinds of feedback that we've heard over the years. Now, I mentioned earlier, um, the PAR assessment, I think, uh, personally, I have, professionally, I have a bit of a bias towards it. I think it's a very, very good um, test or uh, assessment, and I think I was influenced by the white paper from Liter Literate Nation. I really strongly urge you to take a look at that. This is, uh, one of the things I like about it is it's appropriate for kids beginning with second semester pre-K. So that gives us a chance to do a really great assessment early on and identify those kids that, uh, you know, don't have to go through any more suffering. We can make sure we put the right uh, interventions in place. But this is what I love about this. Obviously, it exceeds the top three statistical criteria that we talked about. But this is what I love. Instead of just combining 
the subtest schools from any tool or from another tool, they use an algorithm. And what that means is they assign different weights to each subscore, and then they're able, by virtue of the database they use, I think this is Wake Forest, they change the weights of each subscore depending on the age and level of reading development. And that's very powerful. That really, really allows them to, to predict well, and it ostensibly predicts performance farther into the future than is reported for any other screener. Now, this is my bias, but I think it's really something that I think that we should consider looking into and seeing whether this is something that really fits for us. And the other thing that I really like, or there's two more things that I really like, and that is that they use the same data to guide intensity and duration of in intervention. I know that's a big issue in the schools because, you know, we're turning that model on its head from, you know, let's, um, you know, they get identified, let's give them a little bit and see how they do. And then if they fail, then we'll give them a little bit more the next year, a little bit more. Next thing you know, they're out they're in sixth grade and they're reading at the second grade level. Now we're talking about, let's start thinking about tools that are going to guide appropriate intensity and duration based on evidence-based research. I guess that's kind of an awkward say, way to say it, but I think you know what I mean. Let's use evidence-based research to guide our decision-making in terms of intervention because that's going to ultimately, that's going to mean we're going to be more efficient and that's going to make the teachers happier and they're going to feel more supported and they're going to be able to take better care of the kids. And that's really what we're trying to get to. A little bit more expensive, but I think there's some great stuff here. But finally, the, the thing I really like about PAR2, and this is a bias of mine because I'm a clinical psychologist that works with families, that they have a parent guide. And I know that really a lot of times it's so difficult. Well, first of all, teachers overwhelm with all the other work they have to do, but this kind of a this kind of a tool actually gives you gives parents a way to understand what these scores mean and literally describe activities that people can do at home with their kids to support their learning. So what it does is it creates a language and a set of tools and activities that teachers can say, look, this is what you can do at home to work together with us as a team to help improve how your child's doing with their literacy skills. So. I love that. I mean, I mean, I love that. I've been spending, I spent 25 years trying to bridge that gap and, you know, in a way that supports teachers and parents together as a team. And that's an aspiration, frankly. Okay, so let's talk about this again from a little bit different perspective. Um, just let me get my notes here. So, like I mentioned, the REN, RES test is, um, you know, something you usually see in, uh, you know, a, a psychological evaluation or psychoeducational evaluation. But I know that there's um, uh, a ton of research now that says uh, it's highly predictive of future reading difficulties, and especially in the areas of fluency and comprehension. And we, it, it behooves us based on what we know now. And in fact, I want to just mention this. I'll just mention this briefly. In the neuroscience, when we're talking about functional MRIs, where we actually measure the brain's activity during reading tasks, we're seeing now that, of course, we've known for a long time that phonological awareness, phonological processing has been a core issue with kids, particularly with the, in the area of dyslexia. And we've identified neural pathways that show weaknesses in their processing in their brain during the reading process. Some very early research is out that is showing that with regard to rapid automatic naming, we are seeing different neural pathways involved in this issue with fluency and comprehension. What does that mean? Well, it's still very pie-in-the-sky clinical Ivy Tower stuff, but what it basically means, it tells us, is we have to be thoughtful about interventions for phonological issues versus interventions for uh, rapid automatic naming. Now, make this point as well. 
rapid automatic naming is um, just a, a kind of tip of the iceberg reflection of what's happening in some deeper cognitive processes that go beyond phonological processing. So we're talking about semantic processing, syntactic processing, morphological processing in the brain, ortho ortho orthographic uh, issues with the kids, you know, in terms of them being able to visually identify the forms quickly and tie those to the sounds. It's really, it behooves us, knowing what we know now in the research, it behooves us to somehow find an efficient way to get this information on the kids because that will directly inform how we take care of our kids in the classroom in terms of remediation and intervention. I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense, Ty? Do you want... Yeah, absolutely. And I can just kind of jump in just a little bit here. Sure. Um, and so in terms of training teachers and working with developers of information for teachers and how to improve teaching, we don't come at it from the rapid autom automatic naming, um, cognitive processing pieces, right? So what happens is, thankfully, we have really skilled individuals um, of the curriculum-based measures that really have that neuroscience and psychological background that um, had the knowledge it took to build these TBMs in a way that could be teacher-friendly, that would assess these types of areas as an indicator, just an indicator, um, of whether students were struggling with this area and a predictor of reading issues to come. Um, and so we don't necessarily have to train on that individually, but what we say is that um, automatic um, rapid naming piece built within the curriculum-based measures already that we're talking about. Um, so, for example, in kindergarten, we have letter name fluency. How quickly can you identify a letter in a minute or letters in a minute for a kindergarten student? We know that in the schools, if students at a certain point can't rapidly name letters, quickly, um, then that's a predictor of a student that's going to struggle. And so that's already built within these curriculum-based measures. And again, it's not a, it's not a, um, you know, it's not a, what, what as a school psychologist, I would go in after students received intervention and see what else was going on. And I would do, you know, um, C top measures, like where I'm really assessing all areas letters, numbers, colors, all of those areas to see how rapidly they were um, identifying. But in kindergarten, that first measure, that first indicator is those letters and how quickly um, you can uh, rapidly name that. And so fortunately, we had people building assessments for us or tools for us that already knew that and were able to put those in the tools as that indicator um, piece. So linking that to what happens in the schools and um, systemically like putting that in the school, a curriculum-based measure is, is the way to do that because it's going to flag a child. Um, it's, it, and, it's really a function of vocabulary, I guess, in common language. Yes, it is. And that, I, I, think, I think a good time to talk about that, um, you know, kind of moving forward is how, how can we break down those vocabulary barriers from ran to, you know, how quickly a student identifies letters, numbers, and colors is a predictor of some um, reading skills deficits. Mm -hmm. And what we do about it. And what Therefore, we do about that's it. what we do about it, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay, Ty, I'm going to ask you to jump in here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is, um, this is a pretty cool thing. Um, Ty and her team in Tennessee at the Department of Ed created a matrix in their own process with um, assessing what they wanted to do about universal screening. And so this is a slight var variant because I included the, uh, the columns on the right with regard to the five tools that we're talking about today. But I think with regard to criteria and evidence, um, I thought it might be very helpful to have Ty walk through their process for creating this and you could go away with this and kind of adopt it or adapt it in whatever way seems to make the most sense for you. But I thought it would be super helpful to ask Ty to walk through what their process was for creating this matrix. This is the first page, and that's about curriculum-based measures, and then as a criteria. And then in the next page, we'll talk about uh, a different set of criteria as well. So uh, take it away, Ty. Sure. Um... Again, we weren't the ones, I guess, when we talk about creating things, um, 
realistically, all the people <laughs> that have done research, all the um, individuals who have really given us the information that we need just to pull the pieces together and put it in one way that is easy for schools to understand when they're rating um, when they're rating measures that they're using to determine if in fact it have has all these areas that we want it to have so that we can um, accurately uh, use tools to assess whether students have skills or not so um, I feel like I don't want to take credit for us just going out and developing a tool. Um, it's basically just bringing all of the pieces that have been done for, from all the researchers before us into one little area that makes it um, practical for schools to use. So um, we did in Tennessee, um, in, and not that I'm speaking for the State Department, but I am a part of the State Department, so this could be happening in many states across um, the nation, in many just school districts that have started RTI, independent of the state, um, but in particular in my situation in the state of Tennessee, we moved um, to an RTI framework um, that was required. Um, and so instead of districts having options, instead of schools having options, um, we really um, standardize a process um, for RTI and so what happened was because we were using data to determine um, as part of an assessment for eligibility standards for a specific learning disability, we had to be very, very thorough in our um, in our evaluation of tools that were out there um, because we were making extremely high stakes decisions based on um, based on the decisions that are made through the RTI framework. So, so I just wanted to give that background just a little bit to help with some context. But through our research, we found that a lot of websites that were out there um, did not necessarily have what we needed. They had bits and pieces. We also found pieces that were missing. And when we investigated, we came upon the fact, um, you know, as a school psychologist, I would automatically go to a website and be like, oh, this is my trusted source. This is what I should be using. But when you have a lot of high stakes decisions at hand, you have to be a lot more thorough about that. So when we were going through all of our research, investigating websites, we found that a lot of the websites that have information on there were um, ran by who won, who won grants from the federal government. So politically sometimes involved, personal biases often were involved, vendor biases were often involved. So again, a little more of the history why we developed our own tools to evaluate. Um, so again, through the research, we found that we needed um, a tool that was predictive. Um, and so um, we can talk a lot about that predictive piece, but when you're in school buildings, we want um, we want to know uh, not only does it predict reading success, but is it going to be predictive of how students are going to score on the end of year assessments? That other data point, right? Those really important data points that is uh, tied to accountability. And so um, we needed something that linked all of those pieces together. So we had to have something that was predictive, sensitive to change. We wanted something that's easy to administer, right? A lot of teachers were really struggling with the fact that some screeners that required students to be on computers were 45 minutes long. Um, and not only were we concerned that they weren't measuring the right things, but 45 minutes long for a screener, that's a lot of instructional time missed. So we wanted something easy to administer and score, of course standardized, um, valid and reliable, and available in multiple formats. So can, can we use, um, can, can we measure what is intended to be measured? Um, a lot of screeners um, were using um, ways of um, screening students that the, the criteria changes often. And so we want, we want to make sure that we are intentionally measuring the skill that we want to be measuring over time. So those were a lot of the areas that you know, we were focused on. And so what we did was put an RFP, which is a request for proposal, out in our state, and vendors um, all submitted. And then we had an independent evaluators evaluate using our criteria. And the three that came up based on those that submitted vendor-wise, and we had many, we had a lot actually, um, we came up with that AIMSWeb, EZCBM, and Dibbles were the three that met the majority of the criteria. Now please understand that no tool, no one tool um, is perfect. 
it doesn't measure everything, but they were flagged as the ones who will give us the indicators that we need to make sure students are on the right, right track for reading success. And um, so those were the three that met the majority of our criteria and through um, a point system came out with the highest points. We had set, a, um, we had set our criteria to the big point. Um, so with all that, then we went through saying um, it's not required of our districts to use these three, but these are the three that meet the criteria, um, and you want to use this rubric to evaluate any of um, the universal screeners that you are using. Now, Michael, you talked about PAR. That's not one that actually submitted. We did have a couple that submitted that were really, really great, but they didn't have the years of research behind them um, to, to determine that they were going to be an effective tool. So all of the three that were listed that we found had years of research to indicate that um, it's appropriate to use that tool um, as a part of the assessment of an evaluation for students with a specific learning disability. So again, okay. we have very complicated criteria involved. Okay. Um, you ready for the next slide? Yep. So these are just the areas in which we had interest in determining um, if they met that criteria. So we needed, I'm not, I don't even have to read the slides, but of course we know that these are all the indicators to, um, to reading success. Uh, and so um, we also in our state, because um, again, looking at eligibility criteria, we also included math and, and writing. So um, reading, math, and writing in our state. Um, we are going back to do a lot more work around the writing aspects, um, but we had really significantly focused on reading and math first. Again, that's different in many states right now. Some states don't have the required criteria of RTI. Um, it's district to district. Um, and so that's why a lot of these links between research and practice haven't been made because a lot of districts, it's basically been up to them to implement a process. And they have to understand their assessments that they are tied to accountability and the growth that students need to make in the areas of reading in order to access text to be able to do well on those end of the year assessments. And so we're just, in our state, really trying to make those links, but in other states might be in multiple phases. And again, with the vocabulary breakdown, we just want to make sure that, um, that we're all talking the same language and this just kind of helps clear those, clear those pieces up. So I don't, and, um, and, and you have this available for everyone to use, so. Would you comment on the data management and generalizability um, criteria? Sure. Um, so data management is kind of a, um, a beast that's a problem. So we're collecting data, right? We have to make sure there's a place to hold that data and so a mechanism for it. And it's easy to access for teachers. Um, and we want to make sure that we can generalize any of the skills that we were talking about to that outcome. And so we want to make sure that, um, that each of those criteria were there within all the other criteria so that we can um, create a system not only of are we using the right tool? Are we measuring the right areas? Um, but can we do it in an effective, efficient way for teachers to understand and be able to utilize? Okay, great. Thank you. All right, now we're going to move into some uh, deeper level nuts and bolts. Uh, and as I mentioned at the beginning, I'm going to moderate the Q&A in the beginning. And then we are at the end, and we've still got plenty of time to go. We've got a lot of ground to cover, but we're going to open it up, and we've got some questions already that we want to uh, start with. So um, let me uh, move along here and start with uh, kind of like the elephant in the room here. I know that we uh, we need to talk about, we, we mentioned earlier, we need to talk about breaking down the vocabulary barrier. So I know there's a lot of people out there who are still concerned about using the term dyslexia. And I understand that, and I also think that we need to get much more comfortable with understanding what dyslexia is and how, it, how the underlying cognitive issues that we see in a very significant proportion of our kids really do point to this concept of uh, dyslexia. Now, I can give you a, a statistic that really impedes the teacher's efforts to do uh, the be most effective with this, and that is that the National Center for Teacher Quality 
does a review every year of the university programs uh, that teachers go through to get their credentialing. Mm -hmm. And for quite a few years now, only 25% of those programs are providing teachers with any instruction in their university programs with regard to how a child learns how to read. So from the, from the very beginning, the teachers aren't getting the kind of educational support in order for them to understand what they're seeing in the classroom and then therefore what to do about it. And so that creates this really significant mismatch. And the other piece of it, I think, is that not only do we need to shore up what we're teaching our teachers, so to speak, in the university programs, but we also have to shore up our professional development. So that when teachers are out in the field, if they didn't get that in their university programs, there's a plethora of places where they can get specific training with regard to literacy, how a child learns how to read, and all the issues that go into this concept of dyslexia, and they got to get comfortable with it. So we have a couple slides here, and I'm going to ask uh, Ty to talk a little bit about how we break down that vocabulary barrier. What, what do we need to know? What are the core things that, that our teachers need to know about dyslexia? Right. I'm going to comment on a few things. And this is a very complicated picture, right? So what are teachers using uh, or what, what are teachers learning at, at the university level? Um, how are they taught? And when they get to the school system, are they, in fact, ready to, um, to teach students how to read, right? And so the answer to that question predominantly is no, especially um, in, in many, many states. I'll just broadly put it that way. In many states, this is an, uh, an area of concern. Specific in our state, we're doing a lot of work around that right now. Um, in the past couple years, we've spent a lot of the funding to professionally develop general education teachers, including having Louisa Moats develop a curriculum um, uh, guides almost, um, I guess that's, that's one way to term it, but basically a series of reading modules of how to improve your core instruction and had her build uh, an intervention model for how do we um, improve alignment of intervention for students um, K-12, um, given that core instruction alone isn't cutting it for those kids who need intervention. So in our state in particular, and I'll go over this a little bit, response to instruction and intervention is extremely important because our focus has not just been intervention, it's actually instruction. And we've done and put kind of put our um, efforts into a lot of um, core instructional issues that we see right now, the explicit teaching. And so I think that that link has to be made because if the teachers haven't gotten it in school, haven't heard dyslexia, don't, doesn't, don't know what that means, do not understand how to teach reading skills. I mean, they paid like everyone else to get their degree. I'm, if I'm a teacher, I'm angry, right? You didn't give me the skills that I need. And so we're doing a lot of work in our, in our state around trying to, to bridge those gaps. But like um, you well know and everyone knows, there are still the reading wars exist, and that's everywhere. Um, and so we're still trying to move through a lot of those pieces as well. Um, in the districts, at the state level, nationally, it still is a problem. So I, I think I just wanted to speak to that just a little bit to say the recognition of that is extremely important because we need, in order to stop that, um, we always like to say that bleed, in order to stop that bleed of teachers coming out not knowing how to teach reading, there has to be accountability for education prep programs to actually be teaching this. And that's what we're working towards in our state. Um, Can I stop you for just but, a second? Um, sure. what, I, what I loved about what you just said was the difference between instruction and intervention. This is not the purview of just special educators or the purview of speech and language pathologists. This is really about supporting general education educators. Yeah, absolutely. It, it kind of links back to that question or concern that you had earlier is, you know, is are we lacking explicit teaching of specific areas and therefore we call it a problem? Or, um, or is it that every student do, does have this concern? We've got to effectively weed out the students that actually need that explicit teaching and can be with teachers that can provide that for them, and the students that really do significantly struggle, do have um, 
dyslexia do have a disability so that we can provide more intensive intervention for those students. But it, it's a real um, fine line between general education and special education. And so one thing that we um, are really advocating and working through is a continuum of intervention services and getting vocabulary barriers off the table between general education, between special education, between all education, <laughs> um, uh, and really talking about what's important good high-quality instruction and intervention on a continuum for those students that need it. Um, there's a lot lower intensive interventions that students um, may benefit from and there's more intensive interventions that students, um, not all students are the same and so we just have to get really comfortable with this and so so how do we do that? Um, you know, in the schools, um, dyslexia is a scary word, um, right? So coming from the school mindset, saying to a teacher, you know, I think this child has dyslexia, um, is, it sends panic um, because they're not familiar with it. They haven't had any training. Uh, so not only are they not always, you know, familiar with how to teach reading, and mind you, there are a lot of teachers that teach reading very well, so I'm not saying this, but in general, this is a problem in, our, in, in the school systems. Um, but what does this word mean? And so I'm a major advocate of breaking that down to what it actually means. And these are just some basic things that we just have to talk about to begin this process in schools so that we can get into a more complex system of being able to talk at a higher level around dyslexia. But first, let's break down that vocabulary barrier and say what it what it means to a kindergarten or first grade or a second grade or third, you know any teacher um, but and that's really that alphabetic principle piece and even that's pretty complicated so you know what's that mean okay kindergarten teacher um, is a student having difficult difficulty identifying letters quickly so we have a screener that identifies letters within one minute uh, how many how many how many letters can you identify within one minute um, for the student? Well, that's a good indicator, teacher, that the student might struggle at a certain point in kindergarten if they can't do that. Then phonological awareness, difficulty identifying or generating rhyme words. Are the students struggling with that in the classroom? Teachers need to be aware that if they are, that might be a concern. Phonemic awareness. So are they hearing those sounds, right? And we have um, a screening, we have screening tools if you're using a CBM for that. AIMS Web, for example, measures through phoneme segmentation. Now, is that the only predictor of reading? No, but that is an indicator. It's just that little piece that says, if in fact um, the student's struggling here, we might want to look closely at this or intervene in this area. Phonics, okay, so we all know difficulty with letter sound correspondence. So we have um, probes that measure nonsense word fluency. So, but basically those are very basic. They're, you know, CVC patterns. So um, can a student do that? If not, okay, that might be an indicator they're going to struggle. If they have all three of these, four of these, it's a real good indicator that they're going to struggle, right? And as they get older and the criteria for that grade level moves up, we know that the student is is really struggling in these areas. And the, and the key is early on in kindergarten if we're screening to get on intervening right then for that student. So um, those are just possible ways, and I know on the next slide we have a few, Michael, just possible ways to say, so spelling errors, listening comprehension, um, and strong, strong listening vocabulary, um, but concerns in the other areas. So if they have these areas but not these, that's a, that's a good indicator that something might be going on. Um, a lot of times there's this huge confusion between, well, they get it. When we say it, when I tell them orally, when we read it orally, yeah, they get it. Absolutely, but when when the student is trying to access the text or read this and comprehend it, they can't get it. There's even that barrier of understanding that text comprehension is actually being able to read the text to comprehend it. <laughs> they say, well, when we tell them, they can hear it. So just lots of vocabulary breakdowns. What is dyslexia? So the fear stops. How can we look at this information, divide it out so we know how to intervene? Okay. Ready? Let's go into um, some more nuts and bolts stuff now. Uh, one of the questions is, how do schools put all the pieces of an effective framework in place? What functionally do they need to do? Right. Um, so it, it does seem very complicated <laughs> to a school that's trying <laughs> to manage all these other things, right? So 
core instruction based on standards, depending on what state you're in, um, what the standards look like. Um, a lot of those standards are broken down into skills, and um, they're explicitly teaching skills in those standards. Uh, so teachers have to keep track of that, and they you know, have to monitor progress, and they have to be aware of the end of the year assessment. They have to be aware of all these pieces, and then behavior management in the room. And so, you know, I'm a firm believer that you really have to customize, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, standardize a process for the schools um, so that, um, and, and each school is going to customize some of the implementation, but you have to standardize that. And, and a lot of the terms I um, say, I, I've really stolen from professionals over time. So, um, you know, standardizing a process and allowing schools to customize the implementation has really come from Mark Shin and a lot of the work he's done here in Tennessee. But how do we standardize this process for schools and get little things in place so that we are effectively looking at students um, throughout the course of, of their school day, the week, the month, the year. Um, and schools are held accountable for their assessment scores. So, so how do we help schools get to that end result that they're, that they're needing to get to? So we have to work on fitting all these pieces together. And I think the best way to explain that is kind of how we did here. It's a puzzle, right? Let's help them put all the puzzle pieces together. You need universal screeners. You need data teams, you need diagnostic assessments, um, you need to schedule the time, align interventions, and progress monitor. And we're going to kind of just walk through each of those pieces um, separately. <clears throat> so, so, are you ready for this? Spoken to um, the RTI framework a little bit, but I'm going to kind of just tell you a little bit in Tennessee what we've done. And, and at, at the top, you'll see, you know, like I said, I came from Michigan, and I actually learned and practiced in Michigan and, and brought a lot of my knowledge from there to Tennessee and worked in a school district here in Tennessee implementing before I went to the state level and um, helped make this statewide. Um, so how do schools bring all that research and evidence and lots of great stuff all these brilliant people have done for us to get us moving in the school and get kids in the right direction, to kind of knock politics out of the way, to knock all of these other things out of the way and narrow our focus on kids, make sure we stay kid focused, make sure that we are centered around what students need. And RTI has been that mechanism for many states. Um, and, and unfortunately, in a lot of states, they haven't necessarily moved to that yet um, strictly, but have kind of used it as a gauge to where they can move forward. But So whether a state calls it MTSS, whether they call it RTI, or whether they call it RTI squared, such as um, Tennessee, um, it's a process. Um, a standardized process, um, framework, and I hate to say process because then we look at it like a checklist. It's not really that. It's a framework for how we put all these pieces together. So I'm not going to give a lesson on RTI necessarily, but I'm going to say, again, in the state of Tennessee, we said response to instruction and intervention. Uh, the failure of RTI has really come in that um, we've only focused on intervention in some places, and that has been uh, you know, a, a major um, problem, if you will. So um, Tennessee decided definitely to put a lot of our eggs in the instructional basket, um, and so our focus has been on Tier 1 a lot, so all students some students needing intervention at Tier 2 and few students needing intervention at Tier 3. And then we've done a ton of work around special ed intervention. And if, in fact, um, students do have an IEP, they need the most intensive interventions. And so what, um, what we found early on through a lot of the research is if you are going to foundationally put RTI in place of a continuum of services, you better make sure special ed is the most intensive intervention. And to be very honest, in the majority of states working at, with, um, at a national level working with people, we realize that, that that is not always the case. And so we have to really, really hone in on that continuum of intervention. So I just wanted to give a good um, like framework around that, that if you have an RTI framework in place, your tier one is your core instruction. It's your state standards. It is high quality instruction that you're delivering to, to students, which means depending on the grade level, you understand that reading is very important and critical to students accessing that high quality core instruction. So we talk a lot about differentiation and scaffolding and, um, and how to um, do the I do, we do models. I do, we do, you do models where you're pulling in groups of students and core instruction and, and giving them um, more of what they need based on their skills deficits. But that's not the intervention. 
that's core instruction. And then tier two in our state is in addition to core instruction and actually is the foundation of RTI. And so, um, so I, I won't get into it, but a, a, a recent study that just came out, um, a lot of the error um, in, in some of the studies is that RTI is just that, it's about intervention, and they didn't do a good job with that core instruction piece, and they're actually considering what's happening in core instruction and intervention, and they're not getting results, and we wonder why. And so, so I just, I'm just i trying to really hone in on the fact that core instruction is critical, but that's not enough for a lot of students, and you have to have additional intervention on top of that core instruction, whether it's Tier 2 or Tier 3 intensity levels, and we've defined that in our state, but um, any state needs to make sure that they're defining well um, what, what level of intervention a student needs. Where, where do think, people go to get the definitions that Tennessee uses? Oh, okay. Well, we house it in many places. You can go to tn.gov, and you can just in the search bar put, you know, RTI squared updates um, or RTI updates, or you can go to www.tn spdg.com, and we have all of our trainings, our modules, tools, um, rates of improvement guides. I mean, we have everything that we've developed there, um, and are free, you know, to the to the public. So, absolutely, we're ha you know, that's good. Happy to share all those things. And again, I'm not the one who developed all of those. It was a team of people. So we we put it very much out there. Anybody can access any of that information. Okay, that's super helpful. Okay, ready? Yep. Okay, so I, I don't really need to belabor this point, but of course you know that we're focused on prevention and early intervention, but I just have this um, thing that I always have to add there that while we know RTI should be prevention and early intervention, that the reality is there's a lot of students that can, didn't get that explicit instruction, and so RTI in the state of Tennessee is K-12. Um, in many other states, they've gone with reading and not math. In many other states, they've gone with um, you know K-6 and not K-12. Um, so again, varying degrees, not that Tennessee's done everything the right way, and I'm not even speaking for the State Department, but just me and my own practice um, believe that you know, prevention and early intervention is key, but intervention at all levels is key. Um, we have lots of students getting to high school that are on a fourth and fifth grade reading level, and we know what it takes to, takes to access, um, you know, job applications and post-secondary opportunities. So, you know, we're really working with high schools that, you know, if you can take a student from a third grade reading level to an eighth grade reading level in their course of high school, you've changed their entire outcome. Um, and so while prevention and early intervention is key and high school is reactionary and we know that, we still believe intervention needs to occur at the um, secondary level. So, um, so I don't, again, the wait to fail model, um, that, that, that whole process that you've been talking about, Michael, is that waiting till third and fourth grade to see if students are far enough behind. We know that that model didn't work. It's not a good model. We don't have to wait for a diagnosis to intervene with students, and we've really taken that stand, and I've always taken that stand, that I'm not waiting to see how long it takes for a child to fail. Instead, I'm screening, I'm using indicators, I'm aligning interventions, and I'm making sure the student's making progress. If not, I'm not doing enough for that student. So. Um, that that's the approach of this, um, and and that's the approach that you know personally I stand behind um, in looking at uh, prevention and early intervention and intervention at all levels. So um, I, I just um, can't say enough about that diagnosis piece. While diagnoses are, are very important, um, I I believe that if you get to a diagnosis and you haven't done anything first, you haven't you have not as a school or a district or a state, you have not intervened in, in indicators for students and aligning intervention. Um, you don't have any of that in your toolbox and that the only thing that you're focused on is the diagnosis before intervention, then you have failed students. Okay. Okay. So let's get down to the, uh, I mean, you, you've talked about this, but you know, the question in my head, and it's right here on the page, is how do schools put the pieces together? How yeah. does all this come together? I think that's what we're going to talk about the next. We're, we're one hour in, so I think we're doing great time-wise. Um, but that's, uh, let's take it step by step now so that uh, we can sure. get concrete. You'll, you'll be my guide on time, okay? Sure. Uh, 
Um, so yeah, how do schools put it together? I think in that beginning puzzle, it's like, oh, it's all together. Yay, we have it all together. But it doesn't really work that way, right? So yeah. we've got to define each piece. We have to say, here are all the individual pieces, and here's how you put it together. And schools are busy serving serving kids, okay? So having a standardized process to help professionally develop them on, help train, um, having the common vocabulary pieces, what's needed to stop the barriers um, from parents to advocates to administrators to state levels, it we have to stop the vocabulary barrier, barriers and we have to have all these pieces standardized so that the schools can implement. Um, so I'm a big proponent of getting a lot of the work done for schools so that they don't have to spend time and valuable resources in identifying those pieces. Um, so universal screening, right, it's a must. Now, regardless of the tool that you're using, you've got to become very proficient at identifying skill areas for students that are, that are gaps for them. Um, and so, uh, again, we're not sales people, Michael and I, we're not selling AIMSWeb or EasyCBM or Dibbles, not that I know of, they're not giving me any money anyway. Nope. Um, <laughs> so, but we know that they look at indicators and, and, and so, Having standardizing this process for schools, university screening all students so they can get that pool of students that, you know, here we have this pool of students that, hey, they might need some reteaching or remediation. They're above the 25th percentile. They don't have skills deficits, but we know there's still a problem. They may need some remediation, but here's our pool of kids, according to our universal screeners, that have skills deficits, meaning they have this, we have this brick wall. And the brick wall is made up of all these different skills that students need in kindergarten, first, second, third grade, right? And so in kindergarten, we lay on skills and standards. And in second grade, we lay on, uh, or first grade, we do, and then second grade. And eventually, if there's bricks missing out of this wall, the student's going to cave at some point. And that was our right to, you know, our, our um, wait to fail model approach. Like, let's wait for that, um, that wall to fail. Nobody's fault. We thought we were doing this right, right? But the reality is, we need to universally screen with a tool that will give us that indication that these kids are struggling, get our pool of students that are below the 25th percentile, so that helps schools um, appropriately weave out the students that need what. Then we have this, this pool of students that, hey, they have skills deficits, they have bricks missing from that wall, we need to do something about it. And, um, and then from that point, you move into the more complicated process. But what you haven't done is have that complicated process with all students. You just have this pool of students that you know are struggling. So in kindergarten, they're not naming their letters um, rapidly. Um, and by the end of kindergarten, first grade, they don't know their letter sounds. Not only do they can't understand, um, they can't rapidly name letters, but they're not identifying letter sounds either. And so, you know, we know there's a problem here. We need to be intervening with that student. I've got a, I've got a question here from one of our listeners uh, who sent it in beforehand. And, and it's spe specifically due with this universal screening piece about without hiring more staff, who would be the best person to do the screening, in your opinion? Yeah, well, I mean, that's always a problem, right? We don't have enough money. We don't have enough resources in schools. Yeah. I've been on that end before um, a lot. So what we did, I, I can just tell you from a practical approach what we did. Um, we didn't like to disrupt instruction more than we had to. We wanted kids in the classroom learning. We didn't want to put more on teachers than we have to um, because they need to be in the classroom with uh, students learning. So what we did was always put teams of people together that necessarily didn't have classrooms tied to them. And so we trained, um, uh, I'm going to say a librarian, but probably the majority of librarians would um, not be happy that I said that. It was It's more a uh, media specialist. I, I was you know, retrieving the wrong name. So now they're called media specialists. So we would train <clears throat> our media specialists, our counselors, um, our school psychologists were involved. A lot of time our assistant principals were helping doing the screening. Um, and then there are interventionists for schools at sometimes, um, literacy and math interventionists that we train. And so we had a group of us that basically all were in the um, library. And because the screenings were very are very quick, um, if you're using a CBM, that's if you're using the CBMs, they're very quick. Um, and I think, you know, first grade seems to be the longest one because you're measuring a lot, a lot of different skills. But so at the most, it was six to seven minutes. But if you have a teacher who have students, bring their books with them, they send the outside of the library, they come in, 
they spread out to you know six different people. It literally took us 15 minutes to screen an entire class, if you will, 20 minutes to screen an entire class. Those students left, went back to class, minimal instructional time taken, minimal. Um, and it, it wasn't disruptive to the teacher. So that's sort of several factors. One, um, the person at the benchmarks, the, the person providing the intervention to those students isn't the one at benchmarking, so it's a checks and balance. Um, also, to make sure that students really are making progress and there's no gaming of the system. Not that any teacher in any world would ever do that, but um, we want to make sure that these students really are where they need to be. Um, two, it takes the load off the teachers, and we don't want to disrupt um, instruction for long periods of time. So in many schools, that's how we did it. We um, just had a team of people that actually did that, um, and then we were able to screen the entire school, depending on your population of the school. I'm not going to get into it takes one day or two days, but or if we expand it out over time. But you can essentially, and what we did, I, I had a um, the last school was in a K-8 school, and um, approximately eight to nine hundred. So we screened the school within four days. So uh, again, team of people. Okay, good. All right, so we've got more ground to cover, so I better I'm going to ask us to move yeah. along here. Um, so data teams, yeah. um, so you know you're universally screening, right? You're getting all this data now. Who's going to look at it? <laughs> we don't collect yeah. data for the collecting data. Hopefully, we understand the tool and what we wanted to identify and what we wanted to measure. But we need a team of people to look at this data and say who really is struggling to look at multiple sources of data. And so, you know, you're gonna you're gonna make sure that you have a team of people that can do that. Um, and so, uh, who should be on the grade level team? Grade level teacher an administrator, an uh, interventionist, a counselor, a school psychologist, and possibly a speech and language therapist, especially for those earlier grades. Now, that doesn't mean that you're taking all those people's time at the same time. What we did, again, I'll talk from a practical measure and the processes I got up and running in the buildings that I was responsible for. Um, was we had our core group of people. So kind of like, you know, some of the same people that we said do the screening, we had that core group of people that met um, once a month. And so at the beginning of the school year, we planned it out. It was the fourth Tuesday of every single month that we planned for um, to have our data team meetings. Um, we call them data slash intervention team meetings. And that way, our school psychologists had from the beginning of the year, um, and so I'm talking on the RTI coordinator side, I was the school psychologist that had to make my schedule work for the these data team meetings as well, but um, what we what we did was set that right at the beginning of the school year, or you could do it in the mid year if you're looking to do it starting in January, and you set those dates so that every fourth um, Tuesday of the month, for as an example, all those people are available to look at data. So um, because data benchmarks happen three times a year with CBMs, that's a that's usually a, a day and a half or two-day long process sometimes to look at all that data depending on your population. But when you're looking at progress monitoring data, which we'll talk in a few minutes, you still need to meet monthly to talk about that. So second or fourth Tuesday of every single month, and one of those Tuesdays you're looking at universal screening data, benchmark data three times a year, and then the other ones you're looking at all the progress monitoring data for students that have been in intervention. Um, so if you are scheduling it that way, then you can have all your members ready and available. And at that time is when you are grouping your students for intervention. So you're not just looking at the data and admiring it, you're actually doing something with it. So you have data walls, you know, which students are below the 25th percentile, which students are below the 10th percentile, and you're aligning the intervention time. Okay. So, now I've got uh, two more questions, but I think what I'll do is I'll hold on them until we okay. get closer to the live Q&A in that way and we'll be able to um, uh, we'll address these for sure to make sure that uh, my, our colleagues here are getting it. That was really, that was very, very helpful I think. Ah, this is a hot topic. Uh, you partition out all this business about whether they're diagnosing or just screening and what that means and you know who who does what and, and how all those, it's again one of those things like you said breaking down the vocabulary so I think this is yeah. a very helpful slide as well. And, and I don't have to speak to it long except, you know, to the simple fact that we're really 
trying to use a medical model and a school model almost, right? So it's like, what kids come in for the, the wellness checkup and they're okay, okay, we're moving on with them. What students come in for a wellness checkup, which we equate to the benchmarks and other data, and they've got a, you know, they've got a temperature, they're, you know, when we check their, you know, blood pressure, listening to their breathing, there's, there's something going on here. So the universal screeners aren't going to tell you sometimes exactly what's happening. Sometimes it will. That's how you have to get familiar with your data, and I can talk a little bit more about that. But sometimes it doesn't, and a lot of times it doesn't. Um, and so you have to make sure with that 25th percentile group and below that you're prepared to say, oh, you know, we have additional phonics screeners um, because, again, I told you the nonsense word fluency in some of these pieces only check the consonant vowel consonant patterns. Well, lots of third and fourth and fifth graders are way well beyond that. So if they're not reading fluently and they're making a lot of errors in their reading, you've got to have another measure to go to to say what exact errors are their, what, what's their problem? So if if, if you're aligning interventions to that student that's falling below the 25th percentile and below and you're not absolutely sure what area of deficit and concern they're on, then you need to go in additionally do some, some drill down techniques. And, um, and again, those people who are on your team are experts in that area, right? Your interventionists, they know the, um, the, the, they, they will understand when you're drilling down, looking for phonic deficits, what errors students are making. Um, as a school psychologist in that role, I help do drill downs, find out exactly what areas of deficits we have so that our interventionists can provide interventions. So again, a team approach. Not any one person can own this. Not any one person can do this. But realistically, the universal screener is just that basic checkup. Where are they and what are they, you know, are they struggling or not? And if yeah, they it's are... A, it's a flag. Yeah, it's a flag. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, good. Okay, let's talk about the survey level of assessment and slash diagnostics here. So this gets a little more complicated, right? So now remember that we've weeded out a lot of the concern with students. So we have this pool of students that are below the 25th percentile. Um, we have some that we that are reading on the curriculum-based measures. They have low fluency but they're not making a lot of errors, so that really is a fluency issue. That's not um, the highest percentage of students that are struggling with reading. The highest percentage of students are those that on a curriculum-based measure are not reading fluently because they're making a ton of errors, which means they have some decoding concerns. Well, now I'm going to be looking at my fluency measure and saying, okay, this student's making a ton of errors. This is a red flag to me. They've got decoding deficits, um, and I need to drill down farther. So I'm going to have some phonics screeners available to me. There are a ton of free. Louisa Mos, I believe, um, she talks about the past. There's, I mean, there's several others, and I think I have some listed on the next screen that are not exhaustive as well, but basically you have to have your mechanism of drilling down to find out exactly where those errors are. I kind of just went through a process of telling you how sometimes that universal screener can be the indicator of what's going on. So if the student is reading slowly but accurately, then it can be a fluency issue, right? And that's where you need to be intervening. But if they are um, not reading fluently, and there's a ton of errors, we need to go back and do some drill down and make sure that we are identifying where that student really has the deficits. Um, and that's very important because you said something um, earlier, Michael, about you know uh, aligning those resources and interventions. So knowing your tools, knowing what it measures, and aligning the right interventions, you, you can't align the right intervention sometimes unless you do that diagnostic deeper dive, um, and we don't want teachers walking through an entire program or intervention if, in fact, the student is only making our control vial mistakes or, you know, uh, diphthongs mistakes. If they're only doing certain areas or they're only making errors in certain places, we want to make sure we do quick swoop, intervene, make sure that that's working, me keep measuring them and making sure we've made progress with that student, but we don't want to take them a whole comprehensive, you know, program that says, um, well, this student's going to go back to understanding um, letter names or, you know, I'm just throwing out an example. So very important to do that drill down piece um, yeah, for a lot absolutely. of people. Yeah, incremental and be careful. You don't just have to, you don't have to throw the kitchen, kitchen sink at it. You just do exactly what needs to be done. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, uh, this is a great slide as well with regard to diagnostic examples. Um, 
Oh boy, I, I really think this is this is great. I mean, we are. We're, let me just tell you, we're doing pretty well. We should give ourselves about. Uh, well, no, actually, we're fine. We're about twenty minutes uh, into uh, twenty minutes more for the slides, and I think we'll have plenty of time for questions then. But uh, this is this. I love this slide, and it would be great to just walk through this with us because I think it gives a lot of information. Sure. The assessments on the right hand side, and um, I think that. Uh, it's very important for me to say that these are the assessments that Louisa Motes um, really identify as being good measures of the reading skills that are on the left side of the page. Um, and so um, I, I, I told Michael that um, I've been through, you know, so SOPRS training through Louisa Motes and Orrin Gillingham training with Ron Yashimoto. So I have my certain people that I definitely look to for evidence and research um, uh, away from vendors. So again, not making money from Dibbles, Ames, Web, Easy, CBM, or any of those individuals, but I really look to the researchers and to the practice to make sure that we're aligning the right assessments or tools. I don't even like to say the word assessment, I put it up there, but the um, screeners, because that's what they are, um, with the reading skills that we're trying to isolate. And so uh, phonemic awareness, I just gave you, um, and again, these are on psychological assessments, right? So I've been a part of, you know, doing isolation, deletion, like um, sounds, right, like forever. So. Um, so in this case, in a reading skill um, that would be assessed by Dibbles, Ames, Weber, CBM, phonemic awareness, um, and we're just really looking at can they segment phonemes in the word. And so the kid had the, the student has no visual; they're just hearing, you know, what what it is we're saying. And I'm saying, you know, tell me the word cat, um, k at. Now say, um, tell me the sounds in cat, right? Now tell me the word without saying k, and the student's saying at. And so you're just really having them. Um, really let us know whether they have that phonemic awareness piece um, and if not that's a red flag for us right and so that's a that's a common measure that are in all three of those tools that I have listed to the right side of the page in addition with really great reading um, so important skill phonemic awareness right important indicator um, that the student will struggle and so important tools to use to measure that at, at the appropriate time for students. Um, Does uh, Louisa have a, a you have a single source where she puts all this together in her book? Because I, I did not include it in the in the resources, and I'd like to if you could recommend yeah. a couple of things of Louisa's. As far as I'm concerned, I mentioned earlier, Louisa Motes is you know the queen. I mean, she's she's extraordinary. And yes. um, if, if you've got a couple of things you could specifically recommend, that would be great. Yeah, sure. So, so the content I'm specifically re referencing is the content that we paid for in the state of Tennessee for her to build specifically for us. But she cites the research that she's done in that book. So I can get a list of um, references and work um, that she's done to um, get get to that point. So okay, great. Um, Okay. So again, and so on, on the rest of the page, the phonics, um, you know, the letter sound um, correspondence piece, and then the decoding fluency, um, and that's what you're going to get through CBMs, um, so. Okay, all right. Uh, big one. When do we yeah. move in? So this is a really big piece or topic with administrators, right? And I always like to joke, <laughs> well, we like to joke with administrators and like, okay, you know, God didn't create the schedule, it can be changed. Um, <laughs> so, so we have fun with this, you know, because it is hard. This is a very complicated process, depending on the size of the school, the size of cafeterias, how many students you have to feed, you know, is it four lunch breaks versus, I mean, these are a lot, a lot of pieces that go into scheduling, and so we have to make a joke of it with administrators, because if we don't, they really um, are appreciative of it. But um, in our state in particular, we have worked with LEAs across the state to get examples of schedules of how to do this from all different sizes um, to, like I said, how many times they're serving lunch in a day to, to how many at the high school block schedules. I mean, we've done a ton of work around these um, scheduling pieces. Um, but, but the bottom line is you must change your schedule. Again, I'll go back to referencing a um, specific study that came out lately that was clear that intervention time was not in addition to core instruction, and that's a foundation of RTI, right? So, so you have to change your schedule. You have to build intervention into your day. Increase your core instruction, increase the quality of instruction, increase the teacher's access to knowing how to teach reading in tier one, yes, and that's going to reach a ton of students. 
but there are all those students that are going to need intervention in addition to that core instruction, and it must be in addition to if you expect it to work. Um, so don't do something in a building and call it RTI if you're not actually following the foundation of RTI, right? So response to instruction and intervention again in our state. So, um, and then one thing that we found um, early on around two years ago as we were implementing across the state is that a lot of students were taken from you know, activity pieces like P and things of that nature. And so then it, you know, serves as a punishment to the student. And so this needs to be a rewarding process. Students need to understand their data. They need to know even how to chart it. Um, chart it. And a lot of districts across our state are having students chart their own data and their own information, and they're having a lot of success with that. So having um, students own their own data is a really huge factor as well. But the only way you can do that is have a good free flow in your building where it's not seen as a negative, but everyone can improve and everyone needs to grow. Um, and, and your whole school should really, your climate should be built on a culture of growth and, um, and um, you know, changing what we're doing based on the data. So. Anyhow, I think that's just an important topic to um, really hit because for administrators, this is hard. This is hard work, and um, I don't want to underestimate it, but tell you that it's extremely important for any administrators on the phone, <laughs> or I mean on the line, sorry. You, you're really, to me, uh, you know, the takeaway for me philosophically is, one, we've got to support our leaders to provide Absolutely. them with really great leadership skills. And two, you're implying again what we discussed earlier, which is we have to explicitly think about, rather than having the kids organize around us, we have yep. to think about how we organize around the kids. And it is hard work, but it's also it's also what, what really drives change. Absolutely. So we've got to find ways to support this, the, uh, the administrators as well so that they feel like they've got the leadership skills and the support to do that. So that's, yeah. let's see here, how do I align the interventions? This is, uh, along with the one before, this is really a big one. So let's let's talk about yeah. what your thoughts are in this area. Well, again, it goes back to that, did I do the appropriate drill down? Did I find the actual area of need? And um, as um, certain groups of educators, we really tend to be black and white, and I'll say I'm a previous school psychologist, which I always, again, stole from someone else and call myself a recovering school psychologist. We want things in, in, in places. You know what I mean? We want it in a row and as such. I was like, well, if they're in this area, this is where they were identified in fluency, then you need a fluency intervention. So, But what happens is a lot of times if you're just using this data to collect it um, for a means to an end instead of actually informing instruction and intervention, then, then that's a real problem. And so it's very critical, very critical, that right from the get-go, we have survey level assessed. If we don't have the right area based on our CBM data and other sources of data, we need to move to that next level or line of defense and say, okay, we've really got to do a decoding measure. We really got to drill down here and see what errors students are making so that we can swoop in, work on those areas and those areas alone, get that student where they need to be and get them moving. So. Um, I think that's really important that, uh, not I think, I know, that that's, that's critical to um, making sure students make progress. And I really, you know, say this, no thank you, not more of the same thing, again, referencing the huge mistake that occurs, um, and again, vocabulary breakdown, the difference between remediation and reteaching and intervention. And in our state, we've done a ton, a ton, a ton of work around this. So if I'm a general education teacher and I teach this in core instruction and the student didn't get it and I need to go back and reteach that same concept again, that is remediation and reteaching. That happens in core instruction, that happens in your small groups, that happens in your I do, we do, you do. That happens in good core instruction, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there are those students that might need some remediation and reteaching and this is where, you know, I don't want to cause any confusion, but let's say in a building you have scheduled intervention, and this group of students is going to this reading intervention, and this group of students is going to this reading. And we might have a teacher that's set aside specifically for those kids who need remediation at that time, but that's not an intervention group. That's just more of tier, tier, or, um, core instruction. So the, the, the important piece here is that students are getting what they need, and you are not delivering more of the same to students that have skills deficits. 
find your kids that have skills deficits, give them the intervention they need to close that gap for them, do not give them more of the same. And that is a common breakdown in vocabulary and language and in RTI in general um, nationally, that we're um, allotting this time and allowing remediation to occur at that time for kids who have skills deficits. And so you can keep teaching me the same thing over and over and over and over, but I still don't have that skill to access it. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure that you have your right pool of students and what their needs are. Um, and so that's really what this is about. Mm -hmm. And this might be a good time to talk about how, you know, the, the, the qu we're going to get the question. So then what do you do? What do you do in a classroom? And I think that we should you know, uh, Ty and I talked about this with you, you know, within, within the context of a two hour presentation, you can't do that, but that might be something that we can take a look at to offer as another um, training or course that will specifically talk about how we bridge that gap. What kind of support yeah. services do we give the teachers so that they know how to do something yep. other than the core instruction? Right. So yep. that's, we'll look at that. Okay, I think we're getting close to these these uh, the curated uh, Q and A. So let's um, let's talk a little bit about how we progress monitor, and uh, we're looking good. <coughs> we're looking very good. Mm -hmm. So if if in fact your universal screener in the schools um, is a curriculum based measure, um, then it's it's a kind of a really easy process, right? So. We've identified this student is struggling in decoding and we have a line D intervention and we're doing a phonics intervention with this student and we are now progress monitoring whether in fact that intervention is or is not working for that student. So, or if the student requires a more intensive intervention. And it doesn't take us long to develop a trend, right? Um, of course, you want to give the intervention enough time to work, but you don't want to wait so, uh, you know, a long period of time where an intervention isn't working. And so we've had schools that have said, oh, we'll meet every 16 weeks to look at students' data, and you're like, no, 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 no. Yeah. If that intervention isn't working, then you don't want to keep that student in there for 16 weeks. So we really push against, you know, long periods of time. Instead, we say progress monitor either weekly or every other week and have your data teams meet monthly so that you're constantly reviewing your data and you're able to make good database decisions based on that progress monitoring. Is it working? If it is, perfect. Keep doing it. If it's not, then change the intervention or do something different. Again, you have to give it time to work, especially um, if, if it's a prescribed program, for example. So let's say that we identify a student that has all kinds of you know, errors and phonics, and we have to really go back to the beginning because something really significant is, has gone wrong here. Um, so if you're going back to that and you're following a specific program, lots of the programs will say, you know, it will take eight um, you know, approximately eight weeks for the student to make progress in this specific intervention. Well, don't think after four, four data points that that student is expected to show progress. If in fact, the research for that specific program said it will take this long. So really just understanding the deficits, aligning that intervention, and progress monitoring using a tool that is similar to what you're benchmarking. So like I said, if you're using CBMs, then you are using the same tool to progress monitor the student to see if that intervention is or is not working and whether you need to go back and revisit changing that intervention. Mm -hmm. um, so I think those are the most like important pieces. I think I'll just go on a limb and talk about this, although um, many districts realize that um, the, the CVMs are very important and they really want um, to identify students with skills deficits. They're struggling with that balance on those kids who, you know, are accessing and don't have skills deficits but need that good high quality core instruction and what areas the student, the teachers need to teach and reteach to. So they've decided to go with standards-based measures for universal screening. So I'm just going to talk to that just for a second. If in fact districts are using standards-based screeners that take much longer, CBMs are easy, quick to use, um, Standards-based measures are actually assessments. That's why I like to say screening usually for um, CVMs and assessments for some tools that are, you know, really measuring standards. Sometimes they take a long period of time um, uh, to administer. 
well, you have found a pool of students that might be low on standards, but the problem is why are they low on that? St why are they low on standards? It might be that they have skills deficits, and a lot of times that actually is the case. So if a district's using a standards-based measure, they have to go through this additional process of every kid who's flagged on their standards that falls below the 25th percentile, they have to now go through all of those students and give a CBM measure to identify skills and then have to go the extra layer of drilling down a little bit more. So when we first moved into the RTI direction in our state, and of course in other states are battling this issue as well, what's the best thing to do? You know, we don't tell districts they have to purchase certain things, how we can help them make decisions once they have purchased is you have to do the, an extra step if you're using a standards-based screener and you get your pool of students that are struggling and you really have to go that extra step um, and that's more professional development. But nonetheless, districts have that option, especially in districts that don't have the staff to create their own benchmarking for core instruction. We see that. So. Okay. All right, let's see what's next. Ah, okay, I think this might be the... After this, we might get into the, the live Q&A, but um, let's talk a little bit about this database decision-making process. Yeah, I don't feel like I have to talk to this one much, Michael, honestly. Yeah. I think we went through HP, so you're universally screening, you're drilling down, you're finding the area of deficit, you're aligning for that intervention, right? You're yeah. not only aligning it, but you're actually providing the intervention, and you're monitoring the progress, and um, you're making changes based on that data. Um, I, I will do a quick input here. Fidelity of implementation. I didn't go into this a ton, and you know, if in fact we look to do more work in this area around interventions, that's probably something I would I would choose to go into rather in depth. But fidelity of implementation is extremely important. So we have developed fidelity, um, you know, tools for districts to use, um, making sure you know that if in fact we're saying an intervention's not working, it, it's it's not because it wasn't implemented with fidelity. So when you're doing fidelity checks, you're really making sure um, during that intervention cycle phase, you're making sure that groups are starting on time, that we're using the intervention that was intended to be used, that students are engaged. You know, and so there's all these pieces of fidelity of implementation that the students available for the intervention, right? If they have 10 absences, then how are we making good database decisions on that? So, um, which person on the, the the team would be the the most appropriate person to do that fidelity test checking, so to speak? Yeah. So to not make the process cumbersome, you know, like what what we've always done, what we did in our schools, and what we've said uh, to districts in, in Tennessee is you kind of divide that up, right? There's the 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 frontline approach, of course, of an administrator, but administrators, you know, are very busy, and um, so a lot of times counselors and school sites have also been that second line of defense. I know myself, I had to do a lot of fidelity of implementation checks, and so just really made it a positive process, though. <clears throat> Quick check sheets is what we call them. So, you know, students' names are all, all the students in that little group, all the names are on the top of the state of uh, the paper, go in, check off, you know, each area the student is um, working on, talk, um, talk about the engagement, whatever, just quick little checks, and then leave a note for the teacher saying, I love how the group started on time, or a great job, or the kids were super engaged, like, just those kind of, like, checks, and then we did um, random polls, um, you know, additional checks. So, so we made sure it, and we're very specific on this, actually, um, in the state of Tennessee in our RTI framework, how many fidelity checks must be um, done within um, within a tier of a student receiving intervention. So okay. um, that's a whole nother, like, huge area to go through, but I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, they might just get woven in with the next one that we do, I think. Maybe. Okay. Um, Let's, we're going to circle back to this. You want to, you want to make a few more comments about this, and uh, then we'll move on to the next uh, phase here. Again, you know, it's okay, right? That's what everyone says. Like, it's okay to it's say okay dyslexia. It's okay to say dyslexia. Yeah. yeah um, but what does it mean? You know, and 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 help um, whatever your role is on this um, webinar. If you're an administrator, if you're a researcher, if you're a uh, whatever your role is, if you're a teacher on the phone, um, it's about awareness. It's about understanding the areas. It's about understanding the tools that you're using, how to identify um, at-risk students, and so um, what we need to continue to do um, as a group of educators and individuals that, that are trying to make better decisions decisions for students is that we just have to make sure that we're aware that we need to be screening all students, that we're, we're doing survey level assessments, that 
we, again, continue to tell schools it's okay to put dyslexia because here's what it means. Um, we continue to inform them the characteristics and effective tools and um, professionally develop. And everyone's involved in this process. We spend a lot of time with advocates and parents, um, you know, in addition to all of the educators. And we really say in order for us to, to get anywhere with kids, we can't be arguing and fighting. We need to have a relationship. We have got to build this together. And so um, I, I don't know if that sounds um, very Pollyannish, but I know that if a child with a parent walks through the door in kindergarten as a school, I want a great relationship with that parent because, you know, those students are going to be there for a long period of time. It's great to not only do what's best for the kid, but it's also great to be collaborative and have good relationships. So mm -hmm. teachers don't understand it, inform them. Mm -hmm. The administrators don't understand it, inform them. Okay, um, just I'd like to note that um, I have a bibliography that I created for a school district several months ago that uh, all things dyslexia. And if anybody's listening, I didn't include it in the list of resources at the end of these slides, but if you're interested, uh, please feel free to uh, send an email to me and I'll be happy to uh, provide that for you. It's, it's really, a, a it's pretty comprehensive. It's obviously not exhaustive, but it's very comprehensive. And I think it's based on a lot of years of poking around looking for stuff so okay now um, I want to start by uh, asking a couple of questions that were sent in by a couple of our, our listeners and I asked you the first one about hiring more staff who would be the best person but they asked a question here that I think maybe you and I could both respond to and that is that would you use a checklist to give to teachers as a pre-screening before using the actual dyslexia tools, and the way, and let me answer that first. And Ty, then you tell me what your thoughts are. Because this is a school psychologist, recovering school psychologist. I would say that this concept of a checklist would be, we it reflects what I think we need to take do for edu, uh, regular educators, and that is provide them with appropriate professional development, and in that, within that matrix would be this concept of what to look for in your kids in the classroom so that the way I describe it is we're expanding their template or expanding their lens for understanding what they're seeing in a child's academic behavior or social behavior. So would you give a checklist to give teachers as a pre -skeeter? Actually that should be a part of the professional development that they receive anyway as an addition to any kind of uh, universal screening tools that would include screening for dyslexia. That's my. That's the way I would answer that question. Would you add anything to that, Ty? Yeah, this is a hard one. Um, yeah. And I'll say why it's so hard. Um, teachers know their students best, okay? So I'm never going to say anything uh, against that. They're with the kids all day. They're in the classroom. They know their students best. I think a lot of times we've put teachers through a lot of unnecessary paperwork processes that um, I think becomes overwhelming to them. Um, a simple checklist, okay, as a part of um, this bigger data source, uh, multiple, you know, multiple data points, if you will. So let's consider that checklist as a data point. We want to consider multiple sources of data. But I believe fully that we've got to take some of the pressure off the teachers and that universal screener is the, um, it is that independent measure that is put in place in the schools for all students. So when I say as soon as they walk in the door in kindergarten, we're screening those kids. Mm -hmm. um, many times before school systems are doing it, um, before they even enter kindergarten, so we know exactly you know, where they're at. But the minute they walk through the door, they're screened. And so we already have that data before the teacher even gets to know the student. Um, first grade, second grade, all students are screened, right, within those first couple of weeks. So before a teacher even has the opportunity to get to know that student, we are already collecting data on that student. And if they've been in the school the year before and the year before that, we already have a system of data. That's the beauty of RTI is it's ongoing year to year to year to year to year. So it might not be the case at first if you begin. If you're beginning impl implementation today, then to, you know the first couple months or the first year, you're not going to have that background of data, but you are or that student moves in. But the minute the student moves in, you screen them that day. It's quick. It's easy. You know right where that student is. 
Um, so I do believe there's value in getting all of the teachers' information, but I believe in this value of having that data available to the team immediately so that we're not dependent on um, in what we used to walk into the wait to fail model, either teachers um, over referring students or under referring students. You know, if we involved a lot of paperwork, they didn't refer them. They just didn't want to have to do the paperwork, right? So yeah. I just want to make sure that we balance the right um, things with, you know, not subjective tools and, you know, expecting them know to exactly what to look for or creating more work on them. Yeah, that, that's yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I was thinking about professional development as a way to kind of take pressure off as well, but I, I no, think I what you're saying that makes too. a lot of sense. I do. Here's a toughie, Ty, and I, I'm checking in the questions category. It looks like Christy's going to have a lot of questions for us. Um, but this is the the third of the uh, the gentleman, and I believe it's probably his wife who asked about this, and this is going to be, uh, how do you see completing screenings at 15 schools in a timely manner? <laughs> so I'm assuming this is a district leader. Um, so... Again, in each building, you're yeah. going to have a team of people, yeah. um, and you are going to make sure that you're scheduling your screening so that your team of people can be available to do that screening in the building. So if you're making up a team, and I, and I don't know what your team looks like, so, you know, in our state, there's, um, you know, a counselor in almost every building. Um, you know, there's a school psychologist per two to three buildings. Um, there's an assistant principal in almost, you know, in many of the buildings. And so whoever it is, um, educational assistants are another way to, uh, to um, do screening as well. You have to make sure you're training them on the tool. You have to make sure that they understand exactly how to assess, but there are very creative ways that you can do this. But the important piece is if you're planning it for 15 schools, you have to con consider each school individually and make a team for each school to do that screening. And you have a lieutenant, basically, or, or a leader, team leader at that particular school. And, and so That's right. 15 schools, yes. you got 15 leaders, and uh, yeah. there's got to be some kind of train the trainer, I would assume. Whether it's the principal that's the leader in organizing it, the counselor, the school psychologist, the social worker, I, you know, whoever it is, I, it depends on the state. You know, like I said, we moved from Michigan. There was a social worker almost assigned to almost every school, and then a school psychologist every couple of schools. So it really just depends um, on who you have available to you. But make that team in every building, um, and. It might be a teacher leader. It may be a teacher that's involved in assessing other students outside of their class, you know, and you have a, a rotating sub, if you will. Um, at, you know, whatever you can do to make that team so that it's not the teacher of the classroom doing that screening. Gotcha. Okay, now, um, the way we've structured this is uh, our producer, Christy, is, is trying to uh, curate and feed questions to us. Ty, did you, have you received anything from her yet? Either through your email or through uh, text, because it looks to me when I look in the box, there's an awful lot of questions. We're at we're at 11:45 Central Time, so um, we'll see what we can do, and then we'll try to triage them in a different way if we can't get to them all. Okay. Okay, Christy's saying she's not seeing the questions. Oh, so, okay. Let me uh, let me see if I can get some of these. Would you? Uh, here's one for you. Would you recommend using any of these screening tools with a preschool student? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so you know, you know, in preschool you're taking in a lot of a lot of different areas. You know, develop developmental milestones. Um, you know, we're, we're having this conversation in our state with early childhood, um, and how do we make sure that we are accurately measuring where students are? So I think it's a really complicated process the earlier you go on. But we do know that we expect, there are certain indicators, right? So it's that kind kindergarten readiness piece. And so I'm going to go backward from the kindergarten readiness piece and say that we need to be looking at developmental milestones and all of those areas in preschool, absolutely. But what can we use as an indicator of whether students will be ready for kindergarten? It's do they know their letters? Do they know? So, so 
how can we assess accurately where that student is? Um, it is a lot more complicated than just academics, but if you're using that as a piece of their measure to indicate kindergarten readiness, I think that's absolutely appropriate. And I think uh, that's where uh, I would urge people to take a look at PAR, because I understand why you didn't use PAR uh, in, in Tennessee, but I think um, uh, once you read the article from Literate Nation and you get a sense for um, uh, you know, you can actually get down below kindergarten and do some screening with them with the, with the CBM measure. I think that that might be something people could take a look at for that. Yeah, the more kids we can get to kindergarten, you know, ready, the better, right? So we know what those readiness, we know what the readiness skills are. So our job is to try to prepare them to get ready for kindergarten. Okay. So. Here's a here's a very good question, and I think it speaks to what I was discussing earlier with rapid automatic naming. Do you have any tools that will identify kids who don't have phonological issues but have orthographic issues and who are still dyslexic? So what, from my perspective, the way I read that question is that this is a child who doesn't necessarily have issues at the phonological level, but they have issues at the, uh, you know, the morphological or the syntactic or the semantic level and that's yeah. where I would suggest that you know that might be a situation where um, there might be a need for a, a, a bigger assessment like the RAN, RAS to help tease that out. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, I'm going to agree with you on that. Um, there's a lot less measures in that area um, and you know um, you know, the, the approach to it is the majority of students are going to have um, not just, you know, orthographic typically, um, but if they do, um, there are a couple measures out there, and I just actually learned of them when I was going through Louisa Moses' training, and I think that I can find those and get those for you. Um, I'm not as familiar with those um, at this time, but I think that we could definitely get that information, Michael. Um, I just learned of some of those tools. Okay. Uh, and here's, a, here's a good one. Um, a person from New Jersey is talking about learning ally, and they've got students who serve as quote-unquote ambassadors, and they've discussed yeah. a lot of what you and I are talking about today. And the person's question is, what is the holdup in getting teacher prep curriculum modified? <laughs> Do you have an opinion about that? Mm, politics. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> I always say that, right? Um, okay, so there's barriers to get through. Um, you know, accountability barriers, um, taking politics and opinions out of it, you know, taking the reading words out of it. Um, applying research to practice instead of just leaving it research. There are so many things, barriers to that, that it really takes a, um, in my opinion, a State Department to say, I'm, you know, I'm sorry, we are going to hold you accountable. And um, that's the way that we're moving in our state. We're actually looking right now to develop literacy standards for education prep programs and in, in what areas they are to teach in their ed prep programs if they want their programs to be approved. Mm -hmm. So it's about program approval. It's about making sure you're taking a stand as a state to connect what's happening at the university level um, and what LEAs need. And it's a feedback loop, right? So who are you graduating and are they meeting the needs of the LEAs that they're going to? And if they're not, there's a problem and we need to work on your ed prep program. So um, there's definitely links that have to be made and you have to be moving in a direction where you've already taken a stand at a state level, such as the RTI framework, such as literacy awareness, such as those pieces, you know, your your state level is, is your... Um, it is probably because they approve your ed prep programs going to be the foundation of change in that area. Mm -hmm. Although LEA administrators can definitely be holding the universities in their specific area accountable for who they're graduating because then they're just not going to take their teachers, not for, not for internships, not for anything. So I would add to that that there's um, this dynamic for the last 25 years that I've been practicing Parents of kids with learning issues have been a very fragmented group. They haven't really had, I mean, there is uh, IDA chapters and things like that, but I found that through social media, through Facebook, 
uh, decoding dyslexia has had, I think, a pretty profound impact on elevating the conversation and really pressing for more, whether it's even legislation or whether it's, I mean, you know, I will tell people in the, in the listening audience that you and I have collaborated, and you as a member of the DOE and myself as a member of, uh, as a clinician and a, a person of decoding dyslexia, where we have found a way to collaboratively work together to increase awareness and develop ideas and ways in which we can support and educate our teachers. So I think for the first time in my career, through social media, through Facebook, an organization like Decoding Dyslexia for Parents of Kids has really started to move the needle. And that's yeah. that's pretty exciting to see, I have to say. It's really pretty cool. We so, spend a lot of our time, Michael, I'm just going to back that up. We spend a lot of our time um, and not only with educators, but with parents and advocates and working to collaborate to try to get all the concerns to the table and make sure we're appropriately addressing and the decisions that are made through policy, through practice, are really based on student need. Um, so I think we all have this common goal and it's just how do we get that goal together to move forward. So. Yeah, yeah. That's really good. Okay, I'm going to keep rolling here, and we'll see if we can get through these. Um, I've got a very, very narrow window to look, so I'm going to uh, just try to be very careful. We don't miss anybody. But uh, a question we had was the Pfeiffer assessment of reading uh, uh, published by PAR, Inc. I don't know that test, but they asked if we, if we were aware of it and what we thought about it. And we already implement RTI. What do we need to do to supplement this information to help screen for dyslexia? And that, that's an excellent question. And I don't know if we can answer it here or whether this be something that should be part of the next um, uh, presentation yeah. that we make. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm, I'm not familiar with the tool itself, yeah. um, and so I'd have to look at it and look at the individual skill areas that they are measuring to say, well, you might want to supplement with this or you might want to supplement with that. I'm a big advocate of not, um, again, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, so if you have a good uh, uh, skills tool that you're using to measure and you're actually able to align interventions that way and you're seeing progress for students, then I like the idea of adding to instead of taking out and putting something in, mm -hmm. but I'm not familiar with the tool at all. Okay. So I think we can do one of two things, do it in a follow-up webinar to answer that question, or we can, um, you know, post our comments about that somewhere. But. Okay. These are really excellent questions. Um, not surprisingly, a question came in about STAR. And obviously, we didn't mention it today because that we can, there's only so many tools that we can talk about. Uh, but the question is, what is the best place to see examples of schedules? Oh, I see. I might have included, I might have put two together. But um, yes, of course, we're well aware of STARS. I don't know if Ty wants to say anything about that. But um, I think you well, I can I'd... make a brief comment because the next question I think is really important. Sure. Um, you know, I don't speak, um, you know, for or against any vendor. I will say that um, STAR is a tool that um, districts find very effective in measuring um, standards and um, that in our state um, it's, you know, uh, necessary to follow up with a curriculum-based measure to make sure that you're identifying those students with skills deficits. And it's a requirement that you progress monitor using a curriculum-based measure in our state because we're using it for, um, we're using it for really high stakes decisions. So we won't we won't supply any um, information or we will not supply professional development on any tools that we did not list as a curriculum based measure based on our evidence. Okay. This next one is a is a, another really these are the best questions I've had in so long. It's a really great group of people. Um, what is the best place to see examples of schedules? Uh, this person their school is, or their district, I don't know which, is on an A-B schedule, which is not conducive to providing Fort Gillingham or Wilson with fidelity. Yeah. Um, what, are, what are your thoughts we on have, 
<clears throat> um, if, you, if you'll visit the SPIDIG site or TN.gov, um, again, I'm not speaking on behalf of the state of Tennessee, just letting you know that a lot of this work had been done, and it's been done by our LEA partners. So, um, uh, and, and just what that means is that they've created schedules and problem solved and worked through it and then give it to us to post. We do have examples of the AB schedule um, and, and what that looks like. So, um, Could yeah, you um, provide the uh, URL for that? The, the, not not tn.gov, the other one that you, I, I wanted yeah. to make sure everybody could get that. www.tnspdg.com. Um, there's definitely examples of schedules, but on tn.gov, if you go on there, like I said, and do the RTI link, um, it has example schedules. There's an implementation guide of all the, you know, examples that we've developed and districts have developed. But Okay. Um, next question I might be able to handle is, can you provide any recommendations for screening college students to identify underlying decoding deficits? Um, also, are you aware of dyslexia intervention programs at the collegiate level? Absolutely. I think you'll find that more and more today, colleges and universities, particularly in the United States and especially in the UK, uh, have been very sensitized to the fact that the vast majority of people who have learning differences don't have deficits in their intellectual capabilities, that they are uh, average to above average, in many cases incredibly bright, and that with the proper support and instruction, they can thrive in, in a college uh, environment. The issue about screening is this. If your child or your son or your daughter uh, is going to be eligible for the services that are provided by a specific college or university, they're likely going to need a complete evaluation. And that's going to be done by uh, a psychologist. And what I recommend you do is you take a look at the schools that you're interested in and look for the department that addresses working with kids who have uh, uh, educational support needs and find out exactly what their specific requirements are. And that'll help you organize what you can do because you're, you're touching on something that's really, really important and that is that many, many kids have made it through the public school system and not have been properly identified even though they're now in their 20s and I know many, many, many cases of people in their 30s and 40s. So it's not just about testing their decoding skills, it's about getting a complete picture and then I think working with the universities that you're interested in having your child or your student attend and find out exactly what they need and what they offer in terms of support services. And then the second thing would be that there are uh, lots of specialized tutors who are very experienced and comfortable working with college kids. And I think that uh, uh, one of the ways to find out what's happening in your community, again, is to, to find your decoding dyslexia chapter for your state on Facebook and uh, join that page and start asking and you'll get, usually, almost invariably, you'll get great information about people who are highly regarded in the community who can help support you with your efforts to provide your son or daughter with what they need. Um, I know that we're almost out of time. I just want to add just one little piece to that. Um, another thing at the at the state level, and one in, that we recognize is that a lot of students are leaving high school and they're requiring um, remediation courses once they get to college. In fact, significant amount of students, and that was one of the reasons why we moved to uh, RTI intervention approach. So I didn't want to make it seem as if I'm coming down on universities. I also know that in a in a public sector, public education is also putting. Uh, students in in colleges across our state that need remediation and um, which is kind of what that gentleman there is kind of speaking to as well but that that's also something that we're hoping is going to change over the course of the next few years as we're implementing these effective approaches in the state is that kids aren't getting to colleges requiring just remediation courses up front so so let me make this um let me answer one more question, and we have the um, so you have, we have more questions, but we also have the names of the person that asked them. So after this 
excuse me, after this presentation, I think uh, between Ty and I, we can take a look at the list of questions that we have left and see if we can uh, get back to you with some kind of uh, uh, response for you that's going to satisfy you. But this last question, it, I think, is also another very, very good question. It's, uh, it seems that the approach you have outlined here for identifying and supporting students with dyslexia should be able to be replicated, if not exactly, certainly for the most part, not just across districts, but across states. To what extent do state departments of ed share their work? As administrators and policymakers focus on their own constituents, trying to recreate the wheel, kids are falling through the cracks. Yeah, that's, that's a great, great question. Um, I know personally I'm involved in a lot of national networking. Um, and um, relatively recently began with uh, chief academic officers across um, many states working together on problems of practice in our states. And we've opened up banks where we're sharing all of our materials and resources. Um, so in answer to that, not all states are involved in that process, but many, many are. And of course, in our state, again, today I'm not speaking for our state, but I've just opened it up to a world of resources that we've kind of went through and other states have done the same for us. Um, so we kind of take what we want and leave what we don't want. And I think that's a very important process, but I will speak to this replication of um, work. And that is that it requires an alignment of the stars. Um, we had a state board that was ready to hear it. We had um, good leaders at the State Department um, that were ready to move in their direction, our Commissioner of Education. Um, we had a lot of stars aligned, and um, a lot of times that's politically a struggle. So you have to get that right alignment. Um, and again, I will say what you said, Michael, is that you. Others outside of the State Department have um, a lot more pull than even the people that work in the State Department because we work for state boards and legislators so, um, and the governor. So, you know, really getting your legis uh, legislators involved, writing letters, going down, making sure you're on your Capitol Hill, wherever you are, pushing these effective processes for students um, or frameworks for students. And there is a wide variety of resources out there and information that states have already done to lay the foundation that, that state, other states could just have. Mm -hmm. That's good. Good. Well, great. Well, let me just uh, let me just wrap up here with um, uh, just two quick things and then we'll, um, we'll go. I wanted to note the resources that we have. Uh, you can go through these yourselves and figure out what is going to make the most sense for you. I really do like the Literate Nation white paper, um, and uh, there is a, a great article here from Marianne Wolf with regard to rapid automatic naming and reading fluency. I think if people are interested in that topic, I would really urge them to take a look at that, as well as the research on the uh, PAR. And, um, I want to make a, a very special thank you to Ty for joining us today. Ty, I just thought you gave us a wealth of information that was super, super helpful. I want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, again, please feel free to contact me. And uh, Ty and I will try to uh, 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 curate those questions for you and get back to you. And I think that what's going to come out of this is two things. One, we're going to send a survey to you pretty soon. It's going to be a very quick two or three minute survey with a few questions and the opportunity to, to suggest to us some further topics that you would like to explore and we may be able to put together a presentation for you. And um, we'll keep you posted on that and you're now on our mind mailing list so we'll make sure that we don't spam, we don't ever sell your name, but we sure would like to stay in touch with you. So. Again, uh, thanks so much, Ty. I really appreciate it. It was absolutely fabulous. It was great to be with you guys. Thanks for all the questions. Awesome. Okay.